Thank you for tuning in to the Wiggly Podcast. We are sat here on the Wiggly Sofa at Lower Blakemere Farm and I think you, dear listener, have either been listening for ages, so welcome back, or you're brand new because last week we had a trillion, billion, squillion downloads. In fact, I think the actual figure, young Richard, Mm -hmm. has come to 102,000 downloads for the last three weeks for the top 15 weekly podcasts. So I have worked that out as approximately 15 squillion listeners a year. 15 squillion? Million squillion. 15 million squillion. (laughs) Heck of a lot. What is a squillion? Hev's Hev's always been very good at maths, Richard, (laughs) as you well know. (laughs) Good at maths and exaggeration. (laughs) I think we're bigger now than Radio 1, Radio 2 and Radio 4 put together. <laughs> and as for Radio 3, well, nobody listens to it. No, that's why I don't understand. I'm Heather and I'm sat on the wiggly sofa. And I'm Farmer Phil and I'm good at maths. And I'm Richard and I'm sat right next to Heather. And Michael's here, just over on the other sofa, looking at me in a nodding, knowing way about Radio 3. Do you listen to Radio 3, Michael's a producer? <laughs> Yes, indeed, and the minimum number of listeners to Radio 3 at any time, as it includes in the middle of the night, is 50,000. Good Lord. Good Lord above, really? <laughs> Who is it then? I don't know. Michael, oh, well. I understand. Michael. Anyway, here we are. Here's our latest review on iTunes in case you're about to switch off. Don't switch off because we're corking, we are. We've got 41 reviews now. And here's the latest one from Gardening Gremlin. And she says, five stars, hilarious. It's quite embarrassing listening to this podcast on the train home as the danger of bursting into loud laughter is quite high. (laughs) Actually, I think my husband gets more embarrassed than me. He's never listened to your podcast, or any podcast for that matter, and he thinks it must be all about worms. He asked me how I can possibly be entertained by worms for 30 minutes each week. Little does he know. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, on this week's show, we've got Farmer Phil is launching and sponsoring... Is that with money? This is your idea as well, wasn't it, Phil? It was my idea, yes. A competition? Yep. Richard Ricardo has been down with HFW. Mm. I was going to say HFT, but that's Hereford Forklifts. Oh, right, yeah, no, I'm been, fortunately I haven't been there. <laughs> no. I think some of Phil's past employees work down there, but uh, I, uh, I, I don't. And I've got some interesting facts on sheep. Right. Let's go and have a multicast to set us on our podcast way. Montycast, a weekly fact on farming. To make good butter requires good milk, therefore cows should be well fed and properly cared for. Another Montycast, a weekly fact on farming, next week. Thank you, Monty. Now I want to share with you that Wrinkly Bottom is open. (laughs) (laughs) On Sunday the 8th of June... The Berry Court Garden, known as Wrinkly Bottom, in Wigmore is opening. So if you're in the region of Lempster, Herefordshire, please go to that, 2 till 5.30. And if you're in California, pop over. Won't take a minute. Wrinkly Bottom is open. Excellent. We were just talking about Brokeback Mountain, weren't we? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> Where is Wrinkly Bottom? <laughs> Wigmore. Yeah, we uh, Excellent. Yeah. North Herefordshire. North Herefordshire. Beautiful now, part of the county. It is stunning. Now, Richard there. has just been up at Hay Festival and we've got some Ryland sheep, Rich. Yeah, lovely little Rylands. Well, one's kind of not as furry as it, it, it might have been because Doreen, whose sheep we've borrowed, has got the one sheared. But there's a beautiful little ram lamb with her, isn't he? And he's like a little teddy bear. So we've got those up there and they're in the garden along with the hens from the Wiggly Garden. Lillian and Valerie. Yep. And uh, so anybody, hopefully some of our listeners will be going to Hay this year. I imagine they will. I've but worked out that Lillian... You've got Lily... some facts, haven't you? Some sheepy facts. I have, but I've got a chicken fact first. OK. I've worked out that Lillian and Valerie have laid 613 eggs. Really? So far. 
They're worth a wait and go. I'll tell you what, those hens are very, my hens are, are um, there's a couple that are fairly tame, but those hens are amazingly tame. In fact, if you click your fingers, they'll come up to you and then they'll just crouch down and let you pick them up. Yeah. I have to run around the fields to catch mine. Do you? <laughs> if I need to, you know, I mean, obviously, obviously I don't need to very often, but you know, if there's a bit of is that, treatment is that needed. Is that related to your uh, ginger hair? Do they sort of look at you no, and think Phil, fox? Phil, you know, I should tell you this, right? I went down to do a podcast with Terry Walton on uh, Sunday. Go on, right? It was lovely to see Anthea and stuff, and we had a beautiful lunch and things like that again. He said that a couple of his friends from the local garden centre had been up to Malvern uh, Spring Show, and they'd said, is that chap that you do the podcast, that tall, blonde, handsome bloke that was at the Mormon Spring Show. So, and I, so I emphasise, I, I, I like the word blonde, so none of this ginger business. They meant Phil, Rich. Yeah, yeah no, <laughs> Phil wasn't there. <laughs> so never mind ginger. Terry Walton's podcast, Tales from the Allotment. What did you do on it this week? We did all sorts of things. We looked at growing in containers. Uh, we looked at all the stuff growing in the greenhouse, a little bit of pest control. Did you um, take him some nematodes? I didn't take him some nematodes. Oh. I, what did I take him? I took him some bird seed and Good some man. mealworms to feed, his, uh, to feed his lovely little... He's got a robin nesting just outside the house on a little bar. You know, you can stand on a little bench and see it at the same height as your eye view. Fantastic. Is he a cat so lover? he's going to be. No, he's not a cat uh. lover, unfortunately. So that's why, again, why I like him so much because, you know, he's a sensible bloke. Anyway, I've got some facts on Ryland sheep. Ryland sheep provide good returns for the sheep breeder. Right. In what, <laughs> in what respect? What are we so talking? it says on the Ryland Flock Book Society. Right. I think that might be a little, little bit of a claim to excess. good returns. What do they mean? Income. Oh, okay. Profit. Right. They're kind of expensive, you know. To buy a, a nice U, first year U or something like that is, is 140 quid. Really? Like yeah. Well, cheap. I read the Rambling Farmer, who's Clivedale, our local um, Rambling Farmer, Rambling farmer <laughs> in our village pump, and uh-huh. he says that for the first time for ages, he returned £80 on a lamb. That's good money, good isn't job. it? And yeah. he says his cattle are fetching £1,000, and that's the first time since 1995. The downside of that, that Muggins here has been trying to buy some breeding heifers, and they are correspondingly costing me an awful lot of money. Yeah. About 750 quid each for a heifer to put to the bull now. Blimey, 750 quid. Last year, I probably could have had the same thing for about... Four hundred pounds, something like that. Right. Should have bought them last year, Farmer Phil. Should have bought Phil. them last year, Farmer mm. Phil. Exactly and just right. at this moment of the highest fuel prices ever, in fact, today oil has made one hundred and thirty-five dollars a barrel. Farmer Phil is installing a new diesel tank. <laughs> <laughs> well, Farmer Phil had a bit of an upset over his diesel storage situation because it is old and not large enough. And the other day, that one of my two tanks developed a leak. And given the cost of the diesel, I looked at it and thought, no, I can't be doing with that. I'm going to have to do something about it. And so it he put his thumb in the hole. <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> oh, right. And my I didn't diesel see him supplier, for two days. <laughs> my diesel supplier oh, phoned me up and said, there's two things going to happen. There's going to be a shortage of farm diesel and hike in the price of farm diesel and a shortage of it. And it would be very embarrassing to run out of diesel. So I said, well, my one tank's got a hole in it, and my other tank, the new tank at that point, was still not delivered, and all the rest of it. And so to cut a long story short, I cobbled together another tank and (laughs) filled it up. And, of course, that sprung a leak as well. So then we had to chase around and find a tank to put the diesel in. So we rectified the situation. We didn't lose any diesel, but we did spend a lot of time mucking about. So this morning, we've been installing my new tank. How many litres does it hold? It holds 22,000 litres. How much money will it cost you to fill it up? Yesterday, about £15,000, and (laughs) tomorrow, probably £16,000. The diesel price is going up every day. Yeah, yeah. Ryland sheep are virtually immune to foot rot. Is that right? Hmm. What is foot rot? Bacterial disease between the feet. Oh, like athlete's foot? Very similar. I think, um, I think that's why they hold their feet sometimes, you know, if you see sheep limping along. Oh, yeah, I've seen Sometimes they get that rot. wetness and... Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what they need is skull athlete's foot. I'm not a sheep farmer, but I think it's similar to fowl in the foot in cattle, which is a, a similar infection between the, the clays, the cleft feet, and it inflames the skin in between and makes them very sore. 
The Ryland sheep, they are very steady, you know. I was advised, certainly for beginners, get Rylands because all they do is potter around with the head down. They don't freak it much. And they don't try and get out of places once they're in a, in a field or something. They don't try and bore through the hedge to get away. Here, here we are. An ideal animal, little fact really. here. The most attractive characteristic of the Ryland to the smallholder is its placid temperament, mm. Rich. They don't try and jump out of their field. Because their legs are too short for athletics. <laughs> they are little, they are little, little legs. And if they do happen to get that, out... That problem from... could be attributable to one or two others. <laughs> well, this is even better. And if they do happen to get out through a gate left open, they rarely go further than the next nice patch of grass, which means you are not constantly chasing them around the countryside. I'm very pleased about that because I have had nightmares, you literally, have, you have. about Ryland sheep at Hay Festival. <laughs> I've had lots of that. I've had... Rich, are you sure it's a good idea to have sheep at Hay? Are you sure? Because I'm worried. I don't mind telling you that I'm slightly concerned about this whole thing about having sheep at hay. I mean, are you sure it's a good idea? I said, it's fine. Who, it's who is it's going to be fine. Um, you know, don't worry about it. Because I, I've got this, this, this Can we bribe the security men to spend extra got, time looking after them? I've got 12 bottles of beer in the Chinese, uh, yeah, I must Chinese take those. cabinet I must take those as well. Yeah, I, um, yeah. I had thoughts that when uh, Mrs Sherry Blair takes the stage that a, a rival oh. sheep trots on the other side would be just about <laughs> ideal, wouldn't she's, it? She's there. Yeah, of course she's there, isn't she? I met her, I, I said to you, didn't I? She came down to our stand at DNEC the year before last. She came, oh, yeah. She just walked up to me with it, and then I looked up, and there's uh, Sri Blair in front of me, well, you know, from, from me to you, and she, she said, oh, what have you got here then? And I just went through the whole kind of worms thing with her, and, uh, and off she went. She had a nice frock on, you know, a quality frock. I think you're talking several thousand quid's worth of frock. But I, I imagine that was probably nothing compared to the cost of the security guards that she had surrounded. Did you ask her where her. she got the frock from? No, I didn't. I didn't. Ryland sheep are one of the oldest British breeds and they were originally kept primarily for wool. But the modern Ryland is a true dual purpose sheep, producing excellent meat as well as fine wooled fleece. Mm. I think apparently they're quite fatty. Fantastic flavour, apparently. We shall see, there might be some swapping going on for some pork sausage and some lamb chops later on in the year. A Ryland ram makes an excellent terminal sire when crossed with Scotch and Welsh half-breeds, mules, masham and Welsh mountains. What's a terminal sire? Terminal sire is the sire that you use to produce a lamb that you eat rather than one that you breed. Oh, I so, see. in my case, I use a Charolais as a terminal sire on my Hereford Frisian cross cows but the Hereford would be the breeding sire to produce the cow, do you see what I mean? Mm. Now, do you know why they were called Ryland sheep? No. They're a Herefordshire breed, aren't they? They are, but I've got my best fact ever. Give it to us. Ryland sheep originate in Herefordshire on land which grew a great deal of rye, and the earliest references date back to the 12th century when the monks of Herefordshire were trading in Ryland wool. Ryland wool traded from Lempster was known as Lempster ore for the amount of gold it earned. Right. How times change. The value of sheep wool now has never been lower. 50p a fleece? If that, I think. 10 quid in the Wiggly catalogue. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to change, isn't it? The value of the fleece is going to, is going to have to go up, isn't it? Definitely. As we, as... At the moment, the cost of transporting it and cleaning it and processing the wool into a, a the yarn that you can use outweighs the, the value of doing it, apparently. Yeah. Right. Well, Alison is jumping for joy because, you know, we've got a fair trade policy at Wigglies, yeah. so she's getting a very good return for her uh, fleece. fleeces. Right. In fact, 20 times as much as it's worth, I think. Really? <laughs> yep. But they right. are nice colours. They are lovely. Yeah, I think there's one hanging up on the, one of our fences. And apparently home. you can sell that colour fleece without going through the wool marketing board because they don't like coloured fleece. But the other mm. stuff, the white stuff, is supposed to go through the wool marketing board, which, mm. in my opinion, is not doing a tremendous job of marketing fleece. <laughs> Let's hear about Ricardo's adventures. How did this come about, Rich, that you were off to Hugh Fernie Whittingstall's abode in Axminster last Monday? Well, I had a, I had a call a, a while ago from Emma, who's one of the gardeners at River Cottage, she wanted a wormery to set up in the garden for demonstrations and to um, aid some of the courses they do down there. So I sent them down a wormery. 
do you mean a gardener? Isn't it, as I imagine it, this little <laughs> tiny humble abode with, you know, veggies growing and a, a chicken here and there? It's not like a corporate enterprise, is it? Uh, well, it is a corporate enterprise. Is it? <laughs> well, it's a commercial enterprise, certainly, but, but not a corporate. But it is nice. It's, it's cottagey, certainly. But they grow a, a great deal of their vegetables there to feed the groups of people that they have dining. Probably every night now, they have a group of 70-odd people, I think. Really? And then they, do, they run all their courses from there as well. Does Hugh live there? Various events. No, he doesn't live there. He lives not very far away down the down the road, and he has got his own little farm as well. But they have loads of animals there that they use to eat and uh, and produce eggs and so on and so forth. And Emma was was one of the gardeners, and she she works with another gentleman who I didn't meet, head gardener, who lives there on the site. He's the only person to live at that site. And I was asked by a chap called Chris from Keo, who were the company that doing uh, doing the filming. So they're filming a series of three one-hour specials from River Cottage about all that goes on there. And they wanted to do a piece on building a wormery. So I thought, all right, great, yeah, we can definitely do that. So I I've, I've freight down there, took some Bokashi buckets. And when I got down there, I met Emma first. And I went and I met a couple of guys from Keo, who turned out to be lovely people. Met Gil, who's the head cook, head chef at River Cottage. And, uh, and then Hugh came down because he was off to take some people fishing. Apparently he was taking a group of hairdressers from the local village fishing or something. So, uh, oh. yes. As you do. <laughs> Tough job, but someone's got to do it. Phil takes <clears throat> our group of local hairdressers shooting. Does he? Yeah. Oh, there you are. So I had a quick rattle, and I had a rattle with you about Bokashi, because they want to treat all their food waste, you know, they don't want to keep chucking it away, so they want to do something with it. So I had a chat with him quickly, but I had a, the main thrust of the, of the conversation was with Gil, um, because he, obviously he's a guy who's going to be responsible for all this waste that comes out of the kitchen. So <clears throat> we spent the day filming, and it's going to be on now over the next couple of weeks, um, on a Wednesday evening, one of, the, one of the Wednesday evenings over the next three weeks, I think, on Channel 4. We spent the whole day filming the creation of a, a wooden woman. What did you woman. end up making them? Because, <clears throat> you know, without wishing to, you know, be in any way, you know, rude. Hello, you're always rude. He, oh, yeah. <laughs> Especially yeah, to um, me. In fact, you're yeah, rude and rude yeah, to me. Yeah, without, you know, wishing to be. Yeah. I don't think you've ever made a commercial wormery, have you? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Good so, man. That's uh, what I like to see—a resourceful attitude to marketing. Really? I think you've been blagging. I think there, are, there are many things that I've never done, and but the only time you ever do something is the first time, and so you know why not? And uh, I've made many, many things in my life, and uh, and, I, and actually, a wormery is probably one of the least challenging, really. So, uh, so I've, and what I did is, I, in my mind, I formulated a plan, got some ideas, <laughs> calculated a relative surface area to accommodate the majority of the waste that they're likely to produce. Was this on the car on the way down when the window no, no, was stuck open? No, no, this is on Sunday, uh, Sunday night, actually. Right. I've sat I think down, he got could my head together precisely and the same criteria to tidying his desk. <laughs> so assess the waste, the <laughs> assess the is, surface I area don't have time. required. <laughs> I don't have time to tidy my desk. Anyway, so... <laughs> so, Rich, what so, have you built? Essentially, it's a very simple box, but I wanted to build something with a, ri- with a riddle in it in order to be able to get the compost out. I took down a load of our uh, bases of our worm factories, some of the ones that we can't reuse that would be sent off um, for recycling because they've been slightly damaged in, in storage. So there's a line of those underneath with, with the taps on those looking pretty groovy to collect all the wonderful worm pee that Emma can then use in the garden and so That's on. That's a great idea. Yeah, and I think uh, that was mine actually. And then, no, no, I don't <laughs> think you had any part of this whatsoever. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh. so, <laughs> and, uh, and created a series of compartments. The idea being that waste can go into a, a compartment at a time, build up, to the extent that all the worms are in there thriving away, and then the next compartment is filled. So it's working on the same principle as kind of composting horse manure, I guess. Wouldn't it be a better idea street. if they used Bokashi before it went in the wormery? Yeah, well, that's what I've said. So they've got Bokashi buckets to treat the food waste, all the scrapings of the plates and whatnot, before it goes into the wormery. And I said, look, you can put absolutely everything in there. Don't bother about bones. But he said, no, well, that's fine. And I don't imagine they get many bones anyway, because, you know, it, when you serve things, it tends to be without bone. So, great, I'm really interested to see how it goes. Um, Jess, uh, Hughes PA, has promised me a, a podcast with you. Well, that's been going on now for the best part of a year. So, but so, but, <laughs> but she, she, did, she did promise me on Monday, said, Richard, Richard, I definitely, definitely will sort something out. So, it, you, you know, know how to at get some one. point. But I've got to go, I'll have to go down to see how Don't it's you? going on. Now to get one. Oh. Train as a hairdresser. <laughs> That's what it is, yeah. Well, yeah. Farmer Phil, shall we have a tune in and listen to Ricardo's adventures in Devon? Oh, 
Well, this is a change from the norm anyway today, yes, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you didn't, did you imagine you might be making a wormery when you came in this morning? I was told last week I would oh, okay. be making a wormery today. So <laughs> right, I was so quite chuffed about psychologically that. Psychologically prepared for it. <laughs> Brilliant. So, Richard, uh, really exciting to see you. We're going to get started, I take it. What's on your mind? What, what, should, we, what should we think well, about first? Well, I think um, we're, we're going to create something that's a little bit uh, Heath Robinson, sort of in keeping with, uh, with everything else yeah. here. And, uh, yeah, I know you guys wanted to make something out of timber, some you know, reuse some products you have around on the farm anyway. That was the idea that we kind of scavenged and yeah. pilfered and, you know, put something together with a recyclable ethos yeah, in mind. Yeah, you know? It makes that's, perfect that's sense. It's quite, it's, it's perfectly achievable as well. So I've just, I brought a few bits and pieces down. I brought these plastic trays down purely because they're going to go underneath the wormery and they'll catch all that lovely worm we and, and yeah. compost and whatnot that then you guys can put on your veggie patch. Perfect. So that's something that was kind of you slightly, had slightly independent. And, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, to be honest, these are slightly damaged, which is why I'm happy for you guys to have them for that. <laughs> so, right. Because we, can, we, can, uh, we can't sell them, so um, you, you, you guys can put them to really good use. So they'll catch all the wonderful liquid. Great. There'll be little taps on there to tap yeah. the liquid off. Perfect. And what we'll make then is a big wooden wormery that'll sit over the top of those plastic trays. So in, a, in, a, in effect it's going to be something made of ply um, that you've had on the farmyard and it'll have a plastic grid in the bottom, have a little riddle so as you can riddle the compost yeah. out and we'll make compartments in it as well uh, with a view to sort of drawing the worms up through the waste you know, with all that uh, lovely new um, food scraps that you're adding. Hugh and I are really keen to be able to deal with as much of our kitchen waste as we can yeah. and uh, I know that uh, he's particularly keen to get rid of some of the, the waste that's coming back off people's plates. Right. Well we can absolutely do that and of course the other thing I've done is I've brought you some bokashi buckets down so that you can treat your all your food scraps with bokashi before putting it into the wormery which means you don't have to exclude all the all the proteins, all the fish skins and things like that. Fantastic. You guys eat a lot of fish don't you? Really? Well we deal with a lot of fish, we obviously serve a lot of meat Yeah. so even little bits of scraps of meat that come back on the plates you know, if we don't have to throw them away, if they can go on to uh, bring new life to something else, perfect. Yeah, yeah. So, well, we'll see what we can do, but I'm sure it'll be fine when we finish. We've got a good day for it. Anyway. Yeah, we've got a great day early in the morning, so we can crack on and make a start. Yeah, brilliant. Right, let's begin. Well, if you want to give me a job, I can do anything okay. fairly practical. Right. I'm not worried about whatever it is. Okay, well, should we cut the ply down? And yeah. We cut the, yeah, yeah, cut the fly, and then what we can do is we can fix the, the fix the legs on there. Oh, yeah. Where did you go to uh, London then, Gilters? When? Did you or when? Where did you go? Did you go to a restaurant? You yeah, no, to? I went to a restaurant called Acorn House. Okay. Which is uh, owned, co-owned by a guy called Arthur Potts Dawson. Right who's a really nice guy, did some chefing with us a few years ago, but has now established this restaurant in which he has a particular ethos on how to deal with his waste. Right. And he's uh, installed um, a couple of wormeries. And he's also got this um, amazing machine, which he described as a, as a desiccator and dehydrator. Right. And basically you feed in uh, waste into the top. It can take as much as 30 kilos and then in seven hours, that 30 kilos is reduced to a very dry compostable matter to the weight of three kilos. So oh, it's amazing. dealing with a huge amount of his daily waste. And yeah. it's one of the reasons that he's only producing one bag of rubbish every eight days right, for right. a busy London restaurant. Yeah, no, you know, that, that's he's, incredible. It's kind of cutting edge and there's yeah. not many people doing that. So Richard, if someone's going to try and make a wormery at home, should they do it in wood or should they look to use some other material? I mean, wood, from my point of view, is a great sustainable yeah. and uh, you know, easily obtainable substance. Definitely. I mean, wood source from the right place can, can be sustainable. It yeah. very much depends where it comes from, of course. But yeah, I mean, wood is obviously something that uh, kind of reproduces. Exactly. Um, and you, and you know, in theory, when, especially at a site like this, there's no reason why you couldn't harvest the, you know, the wood from your own land well, to make a wormery. Yeah. I mean, whilst we're using ply in this instance, you could use planks. And if you just oiled them with some salad oil, like I mentioned earlier on, that's, that would be fine to, to preserve the wood, especially for the worms. And what you don't want to do, I and mean, worms are really relatively sensitive creatures, so you don't, wouldn't want to use a wood preservative that could harm the worms. No, sure. And you'd have to use a wood that wasn't treated with copper chromium arsenate, for instance, because that could harm the worms. Modern uh, pressure-treated wood tends to be treated with uh, alkaline copper quaternion, which is pretty harmless. 
to most things unless insects bore into it and eat it and then it could be it's obviously a problem for them then but um, generally speaking it, it would be fine but you know uh, car tires you can stack car tires one on top of the yeah. other and if you put onion sacks between the, the yeah. layers yeah, that, yeah. That, that, that works that well make for, a, a for a worm yeah. and if you get a lid from a 40 gallon drum put that over the top drill a few holes in for ventilation really? you know it's really simple yeah because i kind and, of understood work. that i kind of understood that lots of different things can be utilized as a yeah, worm you know emma was saying that someone was using a, an old television with the insides taken out. Yeah, yeah, um, oh, that's quite funky. Which was that, quite cool because you get the view, you know, you get the viewing <laughs> box <laughs> through as well. That's a really good idea. Which can be nice because yeah, yeah. it can be quite nice to see the worms kind of at work, if yeah, you like, and, yeah. and the, the, the process as it, as it kind of comes down Definitely. through the wormery. Well, oddly, with something like this, you could uh, put a perspex front in yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But of course, you have to cover it over most of the time because the worms only like come out the front. Yeah, if it's dark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you'd have to keep lifting it to, to, have to see the worms inside, in yeah. there. So in many respects, it's probably just as well to keep the lid down. And if folks want to see it, just lift the lid. And uh, we'll put we'll put moisture mats over the top, which will kind of replicate um, a natural environment where they'd be underneath some leaf litter yeah, yeah, or something yeah, like sure, that, and just to keep sure. them in sconce. But if you lift that back, you'll see a whole mass sure. of writhing worms in there. But yeah, there's all sorts of things. But the telly is an interesting one. I like the idea of that, you know. I think most important with a wormery is the surface area. Mm. What you don't want with a wormery is a very deep unit. You want to avoid those thermophilic processes, that heating up in the core of the compost. Yeah, I understand. You know? yeah. um, because worms will move away from that area. So what you have in a wormery is you have all the little microflora and fauna in there that are dealing with the waste, all your, your mesophiles and your cyclophiles, um, absolutely fine. But you don't want the, the thermophiles that uh, heat it up, and you, you avoid doing that by having a relatively large surface area compared to the depth of the, of the waste. You know? And that's, and that's exactly what we're doing here. So we're going to make something that's quite long, reasonably large surface area, so you can put your waste in and you can scatter it throughout the whole unit. Sure. You know? And the wormies are getting amongst it. And we're doing it in such a way that uh, you know, they can be drawn through the system. So. Brilliant. Well. OK. OK, so cut what we'll do is we'll cut these down now. Then, yeah, cut this in the middle. And these will be, um, this will be a support for the mainframe. Splice your mainframe. There you are. Well, while you do that, Emma, well, you can tell me a little bit about what you you do here. Because he rang me up a while ago and <laughs> on the scrounge. I did. Uh, we, uh, we have a worm here, which seems to be doing well for you, which is good. But yeah. you said you look after all the animals and I things do. like that. I love that bit of my job. <laughs> and what? how many animals are here, all told? We've got about 14 pigs. We've got about 20 laying hens. Right. Half and half of black rocks and cookie marins. Right. And uh, we've got a little flock of meat chickens which at the moment are Sassos. Oh, wow. Okay. And we've got nine sheep and two goats. Wonderful. Yeah, and you're kind of, you were saying you're a bit attached to the goats. I get attached to all the animals. Yeah, I'm actually you would, really. And I suppose some of them have grown up since you've been here. How long have you been yeah, here now? Two years now. Two years. Yeah. So you've known them since they were babies, most of them. Yeah, a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. And do you, do, you have to, do you have to play any part in the... Uh, Taking to the abattoir and things like that? No, I try and keep out that. Right. <laughs> I think they try and not to tell me when it's happening. Oh, okay. In case something yeah. goes missing in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> that seems reasonable, yeah. Oh, brilliant. Okay, guys, well, we've we finished. It's, uh, it's half past six, and I'm amazed at what we've achieved. Are you, are you amazed at what we've achieved? I'm amazed, and I can't thank you enough for coming down and giving us, you know, the, the advice that you have done. Yeah, no, it's, well, it's been my pleasure. It's been a fantastic day. I've really enjoyed it, you know. It's interesting to see, you know, what goes on down here. We've worked well together, I think. We, we've, 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 you know, we've been, there's, re, there's been real cohesion between the three of us and we've had some good womanly advice from Emma as well, which is so, <laughs> what's in the right exactly. direction. <laughs> and she's a she. <laughs> um, no, honestly, really, really pr pleased with this, this contraption. Good. And I think Good. it's going to make a whole lot of difference in terms of, uh, you know, another way of dealing with our waste. <laughs> Do you think so it's going to be useful then for, for the garden? For Absolutely, the compost and things? yeah. Well, the more ways we can demonstrate composting, the better, really. Yeah. And this isn't, you know, it's something a bit different. It's interesting. It will capture people's imaginations. It will. It yeah. will. And I think all the hard work will pay dividends in the long run. So mm. I just, I'd be, I'd just be really interested to see in six months' time how things go on, you know. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll definitely be back, certainly in the autumn, to say they're getting on. And hopefully we well, can open the lid and there'll be a mass of writhing worms in there all waiting for your, exactly. your tasty canapes and things like that that folks <laughs> have foolishly left behind on their plates. We run a gardening course and this is be perfect 
to incorporate into the day as another way of producing compost because yeah. up till now obviously we haven't had a wormery now we've got one we can incorporate it into the gardening course yeah as a working demonstration of what you can do at home you've got the big unit that can deal with lots of food waste and uh, and you've got the conventional can of worms well exactly um, we should get that can, can of worms well. next door it might be quite nice yeah. if the two yeah. are together because then of course you can see the difference mm -hmm. and people this is something people are going to see and think oh yes gosh well that's not really going to suit our needs um but then of course they see a smaller model no, next we should to bring it, that think, down shouldn't yeah, we yeah we'll bring it down tomorrow okay mm. cool brilliant well i've got to say both it's been an utter pleasure working with you. <laughs> well, thank you for coming. It's lovely to meet you both as well. Oh, Cheers. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. Talking about Bakashi at Hughes and Rich, there's a question from Julian Wilson on Facebook, and he says, How long do you leave the Bakashi to ferment? So far, it's been two weeks for the first bin. The instructions say two weeks, but I wondered if anyone had left it for months. I've left it for longer than two weeks before, several, on several occasions. It. You don't really need to leave it for more than two weeks, but you can, you can. I mean, I, I think probably the longest I've left it is four weeks in a bucket. What I've found in making it is that once it's fermented and used the sugar up, it then just stops. Yeah, that's right. And nothing happens. Well, that's it'll actually store like that. Yeah. It seems to store wet. Like, like onions, in, pickled onions. Yeah. But once it's finished using the food source yeah. it, it, nothing else happens there's a point to which it'll work well and then it will leave it in there for ages it'll deteriorate and start and to stink you might as well kick the bucket so you might as well kick the bucket <laughs> Farmer Phil competition alert over to you Ricardo yes Phil this is a great idea you know I put this on my uh, she, she, you know what she, she was kind of loath to, uh, to say that it was your idea because I said oh yes that's a good idea it's competition uh, because I, I too uh, have recently had uh, a good competition idea <laughs> 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 that, is that the <laughs> is that the no, environmental think, Ricardo painting competition <laughs> so, so I said oh, that's a great idea she said yeah it is a good idea it is a good idea so I said oh yeah okay she said oh well it was Phil's idea idea actually oh really <laughs> Kelly you don't sound so surprised <laughs> you know but it's a great idea it's something that we can do when we're up at Hay as well hopefully if we have some nice sunny days next week I envisage groups of children sprawled out over the wiggly lawn drawing things on the sketch pads for you so you never know but some good prizes Phil um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's all sorts of but apparently because you've moved upstairs into your new office I mean, this is what sort of says here I'm, I'd just I'm like supposing to, this is accurate because I'd just I, like I'm, to qualify I've been up there I but, uh, want was moved upstairs. Oh, OK. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, you've got bare walls. Well, I have. And I thought I've been involved with the year of food and farming and I've been adopted by a couple of schools as a farmer who sort of liaises with the schools and helps them connect the kids to their food, basically. Yeah. And so I thought it tied in quite nicely with the year of food and farming and that. And we thought that Wigglies with hay and the bits of shows we do and sort of people coming around, it would be nice to get people involved in something yeah, yeah. and a competition seemed a nice simple idea I know it's not a new idea but you know I just thought it'd be nice to get all the kids of all ages and uh, you'll notice from the age groups concerned I think we've encompassed most children what about 103 year olds well I'm pre very prepared to make e exemptions if somebody outside the age range wishes to enter then please feel free and I will look very favourably on their entry. Will there so, be an extra prize group for over 102-year-olds? I'll just say, it's, it's, it's two, uh, two entry groups. I mean, it's under 12s and 12 to 101-year-olds. So what are you expecting then, Phil? Well, I'm expecting drawings or paintings of something outside, in the garden, in the countryside, something that you've seen somewhere. It might be a plant, might be an animal, might be a tractor. A I thought it was in their garden. It is in their garden. I just said in their garden. Well, so how are they going to have a tractor yeah. then? Might be a lawnmower. Uh, might oh. be. Well, some people have massive gardens, don't they? OK. <laughs> anyway, so you're so elitist, aren't you? <laughs> Imagine anyone in their garden. So, uh, Silly me. <laughs> anyway, what amazes me is given your um, your propensity to be slightly careful with uh, all things uh, f f financial. <laughs> Takes one to know one. You absolutely. Yeah, no, I say you know, that's a fair comment. 
And its uh, first prize is an iPod Nano. Second prize, iPod Shuffle. Third prize, £20 worth of iTunes gift card. And no, <laughs> I was expecting, you know, first prize, £100 worth of Wiggly Vouchers. Second prize, £50 worth of Wiggly Vouchers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I, can see, I can see why Heather hasn't, uh, hasn't had much to do with this at all. <laughs> Actually, I thought the first so. prize would be six kilos of sunflower seeds. <laughs> All of these things might have been possible, but the idea of making an iPod of the prize is, is fairly obviously so that you can listen to the podcast. And frankly, an iPod is the best tool to listen to it, teamed up with iTunes. You've so forgotten the key rule, lads, and that is you've got to be outside to paint it. So if it's raining, we want to see the raindrops. We don't want any of this taking a photo then drawing it inside. Okay. It doesn't matter if your paper's crinkly. As long as you're out there doing it. Right. That's the important thing. So no looking out through a window. You have to be in your garden or outside when you do the drawing. And I would say it's got to be a drawing or a painting. It didn't ought to be a photo because otherwise my mate Mark Eccleston will win hands down and he knows it. OK, so entries need to reach you by Friday the 13th, and lucky for some, Friday the 13th of June... Farmer Phil will then make his decision at Preston on Wye Village Fate. Ooh, an event to be reckoned with. And where for all those, the, uh, for where those all who are entries... local to us, that we'll, not only will I make my decision, that we'll, we'll have some of them on display at the village. Yeah, well, it says here all the entries will be on display on Saturday the 14th. And for those folk who might be somewhere in the world that aren't sure what a village fate entails, picture the scene. A bit of bunting around the village hall... A tombola, so you have your hula hoops, wooden hula hoops. Splat the rat. You have skittles, splat the rat. You have your vintage car rally, uh, in which there are currently three entries. You have your tennis tournament launch. You have your sports club trying to get membership. And best of all, you have Auntie Eileen's granny cake and Auntie Doris's Welsh cakes. <gasps> wow. With a cup of tea. And on that note, we'll leave you for another week. If you've enjoyed the show, we would love it if you went to iTunes and gave us a review, because that cheers us up. Otherwise, you can email us all. Richard's not here half the time, so he's not up for emails at the moment. Only joking. What's your email address, Rich? I thought, oh, really? I thought, oh, that's the worst. I could argue that, but no, I, I might go with that. <laughs> Uh, email address. Uh, email, Rich. email. Richard at wigglywigglers.co.uk. Mine is Heather at wigglywigglers.co.uk, and I can send you the entry form for Farmer Phil's competition, so you've got all the bits and bobs right. And so can Farmer Phil, and his email is pwg at lowerblakemere.co.uk. If you want to get involved with Wiggly Wigglers anymore, go to our Facebook group. There's some brilliant topics and there's still the one on cats that we can't get rid of. Other than that, we've got a great catalogue that's available for you or go online to wigglywigglers.co.uk. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye for me.